Hey, this is the franchise Shane Douglas, ECW's original world heavyweight champion. Right now, you're watching the number one wrestling podcast on all of Long Island, Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. The Monty and the Pharaoh. The Monty and Pharaoh Show. And you're watching the Monty and Pharaoh Show. Monty and Pharaoh. With Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. It's Monty and the Pharaoh. 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 Monty and Pharaoh. It's Monty and the Pharaoh. And Monty and the Pharaoh. Oh, is it Monty and the Pharaoh? Monty and Pharaoh. Dad. The Monty and the Pharaoh show. The Monty and the Pharaoh. To the Monty and the Pharaoh show. And it's Monty and the Pharaoh, baby. Watching Monty and the Pharaoh. With Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. Oh, what a rush. We've got the future Hall of Famer, that rocker, Marty Giannetti, MJ in the house. And I'm sitting here with two more future Hall of Famers, Monty and the Pharaoh. We're doing that stuff and we're going to rock it. Welcome back to a special Saturday edition of Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast. Monty and Afaro seen only here live out of Rockstar Studios, Village Connection Radio, out of Huntington, New York. At the board is the owner and super producer, Mr. Jim Savali. Jim, good morning, sir. What up, man? I think that uh, I think that this show put Huntington on the map, bro. Did, did you guys know what, anything about Huntington? Not until I got here for this, right there. For See, this we show. Proved it. There yeah. you go. That's that. And to the right is the star of the show, Mr. Jimmy Farrow. Jimmy, how are you, friend? It's morning. I was Hi. I was concerned you might not get up this You morning. should be. Once again, I want to thank our show sponsors, Seats Link. Uh, there you go. Off the rails, Coffee Roasters. See, I, nice. I don't have my shit together either. Oh, no, that's morning, okay. So. And I want to thank the band Aqua Cherry, which is the official Monty Nefaro theme song. But more importantly, we've got two special guests in the house. None of the two pro wrestling superstars, Mr. Shane Douglas. What's up, brother? What is up? How you guys doing, man? Uh, good, good. And Mr. Just Incredible. How are you guys? Hey, good. Man. Hey, man. Good morning. Thank you for coming in so this morning. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Appreciate you All right, us. so here's how the show is going to go. Uh, Mr. Jimmy Farrell will just go over some of your career highlights, and then let's just have a good conversation about anything you want, and we know what we're going to open up with anyway. So. All righty, then. Good morning, folks. The Farrell is going to attempt to form sentences, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> part of our first of two very special guests this morning, uh, Peter Joseph P.J. Polacco, born October 16th, oh, the day before the Farrell, and Eric Sims' birthday. Very interesting. 1973? Also. Oh, really now? Okay. Who Semi memorizes these people's birthday? I don't know. I have enough trouble remembering my wife's birthday. <laughs> yeah. was, or your own. Peter Polacco's birthday. Yeah. But you know, you're a young guy, dude. No, yeah, you are. Not really. No, well, compared to us, <laughs> you are. <laughs> you are. You're doing all right. You know, we'll get there before you. If the you mileage, listen. not the age. That's right. There you go. Um, Mr. Polacco, semi-retired, so it says on this sheet. American, yeah, fully active. Fully active. So, so much for that car that crap. Uh, American professional wrestler, obviously best known for his appearances with ECW, of course, WWF. Mostly known, of course, for the awesome name Just Incredible. He is also known for an earlier stint in WWF under the ring name Aldo Montoya, a one-time ECW World Heavyweight Champion, a multiple-time tag team champion with the awesome and very, very much underrated in my mind, Landstorm. 
Uh, this is, folks, the great. Not just the coolest. <laughs> not just the best. This is just incredible. Nice. All right, man. Uh, that's and, quite the intro, right? Yeah, and the intro. Hannibal doesn't give you that kind of intro. He just goes straight <laughs> to the bullshit with you. Yeah. 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 Right. Do what it. are you going to do? Oh, <laughs> that's just go ahead. Oh, dry paint. Anyway. Guess number two, folks, of course. And in my mind, basically the man who <coughs> built everything from my personal favorite company, ECW, started it all. Born November 21st, 1964, Troy Allen Martin, of course, American professional wrestler, better known by his ring name, Shane the Franchise Douglas. He is best known for his 10 years, of course, in ECW, where he helped build the ship, if not put it on his shoulders in the very <laughs> beginning. World Championship Wrestling, of course, where I wanted to smack Bischoff all over the place. <laughs> uh, World Wrestling Federation, <laughs> sorry! World Wrestling Federation, of course, where there's several people we want to smack all over the place. Uh, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, one of my personal favorites, and of course, partnered up with the awesome Francine, ladies and gentlemen, the franchise, the original ECW World Heavyweight Champion. What's up, guys? Man. Shane Douglas. All right, baby, all right. Thank you. Shane, for your podcast, you need a pharaoh, dude. I, I, I you know, I mean, think about that. You need what? a pharaoh. What are you doing? Everybody needs their own off? personal pharaoh. What is going on here? That's Slide terrible. them all over. Right? <laughs> oh, my God. Thank you. Thank you. Let's talk about the most important thing on the docket right now. Plastic straws. Oh. What? Uh, paper straws. This is, uh, no, it's paper. Well, no. Well, it's well, paper straws and be. plastic straws. And what this straw has been in there for five, ten minutes, and it's already starting to bend and wobble. It'll never make it to the end of the... Come on, Dunkin' Donuts. Get your head out of your asses. How what does, the hell? How does a... Uh, uh, Shane, you're you're intelligent. I'm semi. I'm, I, <laughs> I bought her, but how does paper and wait, 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 what liquid... about Justin? He doesn't get an intelligence... No, I, uh, I, does he well, wait? Of course he is, but I'm, I mean, but this was Shane's uh, beef when he came in, so explain to me, oh, oh, scientific one, how paper and <laughs> liquid... Are even supposed to be together? What is that well, thing? It, it, there's a reason they don't make ships out of paper because <laughs> paper and water and liquids don't, I don't mix. Yeah. I don't uh, understand this concept. But, you know, PJ made a great point. You know, they they're saving the world by no plastic straws, right? Are they? The cup is plastic, so yeah. what? Yeah, the the right? the cup is well, yeah, because the cup that, that's that's because the government has to take one step at a time, right? Oh, let's yeah. start with the straw yes. first, and let's go to this. But then eventually, people bitch enough. We'll go back to plastic. Oh, yeah. Because really, who cares about the future of the planet, right? Because we'll be dead by the time it's going to collapse oh, yeah. anyway. What the hell? Fucking meteor hits us in 20 years. We're all dead anyway. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. We're all good. We're all up there in age. The great extinction's coming. <laughs> I don't feel like we're learned anything. Paper straws. Th what is that? All right, before we get to wrestling stuff, you guys want to weigh in on the uh, Iran deal with uh, Trump? Ooh. Well, uh, the first thing is like the shooting this plane down, right? We we hear from news, uh, the news stations, that they have you know one of the most advanced air uh, you know defense systems and everything else, and they can't tell the difference of a plane ascending, a big seven forty seven, and think it's a missile. Uh, I'd say they might want to upgrade their uh, operating system because, uh, you know, all joking aside, 176 people dead. You know, they thought they had taken the high ground, right, you know, by, by you know, shooting the missiles off into, the, in, into a few buildings. Uh, and then they shoot down a plane and 176 people die. It's nauseating. You know, it really is nauseating. Justin? I have no comment. I, I, okay. You know. Stay away from that. Yeah. yeah. Stay away from that crap. I got you. If I'm not informed, Yo, I got you. I like yeah, I got you. you know? I got you. All right. Well, let's hit some wrestling. Yeah. Justin, what was your first big break in pro wrestling? Uh, my first big break was uh, 1993. I was doing jobs as PJ Walker uh, on the original Monday Night Raw at uh, that little uh, Manhattan Center uh, in New York City. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was wrestling uh, IRS Mike Rotundo, and uh, they was doing a feud with Razor Ramon, and uh, Razor came out to you know distract him, and I got I rolled him up one two three, so that got my name on the map. And uh, my real big break came when uh, Brian Lee um, came to WWE as the Fake Undertaker, and uh, I live in Connecticut, and the office is in Connecticut, and before they had a performance center there, you had a little TV studio, which I believe is still there. Uh, they put up a ring, and me, Mark, under the real Undertaker, and Brian Lee, we worked out all week so Brian could replicate Undertaker's moves. Friday, we had a dress rehearsal, 
because I was supposed to wrestle him on Monday Night Raw Live. Pat and Vin, Pat Patterson, Vince McMahon came down, so it was just all of us, very close quarters. And uh, Pat Patterson started to talk to me, like, you know, this kid's good, talking to Vince, and he goes, what, uh, what nationality are you? And I said, well, I'm Portuguese. He goes, hey, Vince, this guy's Portuguese. I know I do a bad Pat. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyways, and I was like, okay, that's kind of weird that it's a big deal that I'm Portuguese. He goes, do you speak it? I said, yes, sir, I do. And again, he told Vince, I speak it. <laughs> Apparently the whole time, they had drawn up a character for Aldo Montoya. He was supposed to be a soccer player uh, because we were doing, business was bad in the United States, so they were planning on going to Brazil, which Portuguese okay. speaking country and Portugal, whatever. Um, so that was the entire, yeah, uh, I just was in the right place at the right time. Right. I mean, I was fairly talented, but very inexperienced at that point. I've only had maybe 40 or 50 matches under my belt. Um, so I was just, you know, right place, right time. What was, was it like me. early on working out with guys the size of an undertaker? Uh, <laughs> that had to be know. interesting. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was very, very intimidating. I don't think people, it's mm. not like that today, I noticed. But back then, you know, I remember one of my first matches, I wrestled, my first match in WWE, or WWF at the time, I wrestled Lex Luger. Okay. And the rings were so big and the lights, it was so intimidating. I'd never been on television before. And you, you know, I don't think people understand how big those guys were and yeah. how intimidating he was. <laughs> and uh, back then, like, I got in the ring to just see if I can run the, you know, just to get my foot, you know, my head wrapped around it because I wanted to do a good job. And people are like looking at like nobody was in the ring. Now everybody's in the ring working out all their stuff and doing yeah. all this stuff. And I was like, people were like looking at you like, what is this kid doing in the ring? I was just trying to run the rope, see if, you know, sure. get my steps. And uh, yeah, I was, you know. So uh, yeah, that was uh, that was really it, man. It was uh, I was 19, 20 years old. You know, I was definitely not prepared, both as a young man and a performer. But I quickly uh, quickly learned, and it was a great. I'll tell you what, it was a great experience. I got to travel the world, um, work with a lot of amazing people, and uh, you know, and it helped. What I think helped me was at least I knew, even though the Aldo character wasn't you know anything to talk about. Mm. Uh, you got the experience to be on live television. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, to work television. Yeah. And I think when I went to ECW, I think Paul recognized because ECW had had their first pay-per-view, I, I believe, barely legal, going into their second one. I was part of the second one and all the uh, all of them from then on. But I think he was looking for somebody that was young and could, had been familiar with television mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just think it helped me and I learned really everything else from ECW. I'm right. The, uh, a better performer and you know right. character and oh, actually, it's like night and I never day. did promos between the two. Really, you know, uh, until I got to ECW, so I wasn't right. very good at those either when I first got there. And uh, you know, but it was uh, it was definitely interesting. <laughs> cool, you know, Shane. Um, clearly, Justin broke in, and I'm sh and you obviously broke in during a time where the value in becoming a wrestler was much higher at the level than it is today. How do you feel about the fact that it doesn't seem like today there's there's no licensing required? Anybody can just get mm. in the ring. It wasn't like you guys. I mean, it was a completely different situation. How do you feel about today's state of how it is so easy to just for anybody to get in the ring today and call themselves a wrestler? Sure. Your yeah. thoughts? Well, I, I mean, I look back and I think, you know, the way I came into the business, you know, you, know, you say about break. My first break came in 1978 meeting Dominic DiNucci. And, you know, Dominic was one of the big stars from that previous generation, world tag team champion multiple times, just a great guy oh. and a fantastic trainer. And, uh, but there, like, for instance, we first started at Dominic school, we were six months only on the mats. You know, the ring is sitting right there. When you're a kid, that's all you want to do is get in that ring and hit the ropes, right? Yeah. We were on the mats for six months, forbidden of getting into, to getting in the ring. And if you got in that ring, forbidden, you, you, you all forbidden. Oh, interesting. And you probably get your ass stretched. You know, Dominic was you know, pretty pretty uh, well versed amateur wrestler. What would be stretched, by the way? Just uh, give me a few details. <laughs> Dominic used to do this thing. That, you know, you hear these stories of, like people that would get hurt, like breaking bones and stuff to see if he'd come back. Dominic never went to that degree, but he would you know wrestle around with you and really push you. Uh, you know, I had some amateur background, and he'd really push you, but then when he was ready, he would just take you down and elbow in your cheek, you know, and just, you know, leaning in to you, let you know he's he's the boss, you know, and no reason to try to, to fight in his, back. in his prime was a large oh, man. Big Under, boy. Underratedly yeah. large. Yeah, big, big guy. Real big guy. Yeah. About 6'3", six, 6'2", three, six, six, three, at the time, about 265, you, I'd say. Do you think anything should be changed today as far as, like, proper licensing, perhaps, uh, you know? 
Well, I, I think so. The point I was going to make is that, like, when I got my break break in the business and went to UWF, there I, nobody ever came to me and said this, but I'm certain it happened that Bill Watts probably on a week to week or at least every couple of weeks was going to Pez Watley, who I started working with first, and then went to Dick Slater, then Dick Murdoch, and I'm sure along the way somewhere, hey, how's the kid doing? How's the kid doing? Mm-hmm. And if those if they would come back and say hey, the kid's got an attitude. Uh, the kid's stiff, the kid doesn't have it. Yep. You'd have seen Shane Douglas disappear and some other kid would have gotten that spot. Uh, Dominic taught me you know, the best advice I'd ever gotten in the wrestling business, and me, Mick, and all of us, Cody Michaels and Brian Hildebrand, told us keep our mouth shut and eyes and ears open. And I never opened my mouth. When I went to WWF the first time to do jobs with Randy Savage, the first person I worked with, and he said to me, uh, so what can you do, kid? And I you know, thought, <laughs> I was like real sheepishly so well, I can drop kick and I can and he said no what's your best stuff you know I was like intimidated to even talk because we were taught not to do that mm-hmm. and uh, afterwards he came back and I'll never forget this he came back and uh, you know put me over a little bit and got himself over big came back afterwards and he thanked me and thanked me and thanked me he said always remember kid if you ever plan on having a career in this business always thank the guy that puts you over wow. mm-hmm. and Randy and he Monster actually, and he Savage, actually helped you out and put you over a bit yeah. which is amazing that is a guy that high Absolutely. guys we're going to take a short commercial break we'll be right back all right we're back that was simple right <laughs> world of professional wrestling how do you guys keep a relationship how do you keep a marriage strong? <laughs> you How do don't. you become a good friend? <laughs> you don't. Oh, yeah. you don't. Well, and honestly, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it decimates marriages, right? For people that stay married, is a pretty amazing thing. Yeah. Uh, the, the toughest part of our business, and guys, when I first of all, so everybody understands, I say it in my podcast all the time. When I say the boys, I mean the men and the women in the dressing room. Everybody's the boys. Uh, it's you know you're on the road the boys never complain about being on the road we you know we chose that life but you missed your kids first words first steps first days of school mm-hmm. you know all the big birthdays and you know all that kind of stuff uh, you know you pretty much are married to the business and the 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 strongest women can can bear that out and and, and you know maintain the marriage but you know I, I I've never done a study on the figures, but I'd say it's probably north of ninety percent that yeah, marriages fail. A special type of uh, woman to to wait. For Absolutely, the, I've been married twenty three years. There you go. God bless. Married wow. in, uh, well done, sir. So when's the book coming out to give the rest of us tips? <laughs> yeah, actually, you know, I actually have a book coming. That out. would be there. It is. While. There it uh, is. Chapter three. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, I, I, I got I got <laughs> married. Uh, three. Yeah, seriously. Okay. I got married uh, June fourth, nineteen ninety seven. I'm still married to the same young lady. Okay. Three beautiful kids. Uh, uh, Congratulations. My oldest son is uh, Rowan University sophomore, uh, Teak. Very cool. Uh, you know, fraternity. So he's he's a great kid. I'm very blessed. And what I think what helped me at least was ECW. Yeah. Because uh, a lot of it, uh, we started to travel. We traveled all over the place, but mm-hmm. uh, mostly it was in the Northeast. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, my wife's from New Jersey, so and she has actually worked with the company uh, doing the merchandise. Mm-hmm. Until okay. she got pregnant with my son, who was born in two thousand. So, so she, you met she through the company. No, we we met oh, you knew? outside, but uh, okay. when she when she was coming around, anyways, and uh, that was when Damien got fired. Yeah. I believe uh, some uh, oh, a position opened up, and she was traveling with me, anyways, because um, mm-hmm. we didn't have kids at the time. So it just worked out. Worked um, we traveled until 2000. Were you, wor- were you worried about the boys, though? No. Right? We all hear about no. what happens no. in a lot of them, right? <laughs> if it was WWE, I might have been worried. But ECW was, uh, I mean, it sounds weird, but it was a very family. I mean, we were a family. We yeah, were that's very, true. We wouldn't do that stuff, you know. What do uh, kids take when they see videos of, of dead? They don't, you know, they've been around it so long, they really don't I'm just curious. Yeah, they don't like, they don't like they, Check they, out they, dead. They don't, no, they don't, no. Really? They really don't. Okay. They stay as far away from it as possible. Well, okay. as, as professional wrestlers, right, you guys have to have egos. So it's just oh, thinking yeah. about, yeah, like, regular right. life, right? You know, if you're lucky enough, you don't get fired from a job or whatever else. Sure. How does it affect your ego when you get let go from a company? Uh, for me, I, you know, it, it's sort of like it was a revolving door. I, you know, I came into the business when there were still the territories. And so, you know, if company A fired you or let you go or wrapped you up, you went to company B, C, D, E, F, G. Uh, as that changed, you know, for most of my career in the ring, 
you still had WWF, WCW, and ECW, so there still were alternatives. But it wasn't a hit to your ego. Uh, like, weren't you, like, you know, you got families, you got kids, and you're like, oh, man, you know. I gotta you have. usually see the writing on the wall anyways, and there's usually a lot of things that come with it. It's a very, it, Pro wrestling is one of the strangest things because sometimes talent doesn't always... Uh, you know what I mean? It doesn't always... The cream doesn't always rise at the time. Well, it's some... I mean, but it, it's not necessarily always the case. It usually yeah. does, but not necessarily always. Uh, and I mean, we've both been in that situation where <laughs> we've, you know, been in a place that didn't do uh, much with us. But uh, nonetheless, it doesn't hurt my ego. What hurt our... Uh, I mean, what hurt a lot of the guys was um, in 2001 when ECW and ironically WCW went out of business and... Uh, I mean, that's, you, you got three places to work, now you got one. Yeah. And that really, uh, that was a scary time in the business. Sure. You know? yeah. mm. Shane, I wanted to ask you, and I, this is not easy for me. Mike, of course. I purposely gave him this he question. He gives me this these the questions! <laughs> uh, as we know, there's some history with you and Scott Hall, obviously. Yeah. Uh, Scott Hall was in here once with us, and he did give us a kick-ass interview, but quite honestly, personally, afterwards, I wasn't too thrilled. I was like, what's this guy's problem? Anyway, he had some not-so-great words about you in response to your story about what went down with that intercontinental yeah. thing. He to, to sum it up, basically, he was like, for a guy who has a lot to say, he didn't, he wasn't a great talker, and he was small, he's this, that, and the other thing. Do you have any rebuttal? Which, I, which first uh, of all, which is I don't get such the small a bunch thing. of... I no, I don't, I don't I get under, any of He's I, a great talker, too. What are we talking about? I understand. One of the best what, in the business. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm very... You know? I understand Hall's a tall <sighs> guy. Yeah. But at no time, like... I was a little yeah, taken aback. Like this is this is not a small guy. This is a big guy. This yeah. is like a guy you well, don't want to fuck with the, or fight with, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So the anyway. problem was is, is I sensed a huge amount of disrespect, and, and coming from a fan who knows what he's looking at for almost forty five mm. years yeah. now, how dare you? First of all, but any any rebuttal well, to uh, Mister uh, Hall? <laughs> my rebuttal to it is my my career speaks for itself. You know, Sweet. I came into the business. When you know my dad, my uncle, my brother wasn't a booker, uh, I had no family in the business. Uh, I I was taught to go out there and do it in the ring. Right. Uh, I, I worked my ass off to learn my craft because you had to. Right. I, I said earlier, if, if I hadn't, you know, I'd have been out the back door, and some other kid would have been in that spot. Uh, but I've always loved professional wrestling since I was six, seven years old and first started watching studio wrestling in Pittsburgh with Bruno and Bill Cardill and Dominic and Haystacks and mm -hmm. Jumpin' Johnny DeFazio and mm -hmm. uh, the Valiant Brothers and all the great, great... The uh, Wolfman? The, the Wolfman, all those guys, right? <laughs> I want out the Wolfman. Yes. Yes. Oh, I love the Wolfman. Uh, the big X on the screen. But <laughs> I wanted to be able to do what those guys did. And then later as I was coming up in the business, you know, you see it taken to a whole new level, like, you know, no pun intended, but the business on steroids, right? You see Randy Macho Man Savage, this colorful, larger-than-life, incredible talent. And you, you think in the back of your head someplace, well, I'd like to try to be like that, but you never were pretentious enough to believe that you could be. And then, you know, something just clicks. You know, Steve Austin and I, when I was doing his podcast, we, we hadn't spoken in years, and he asked me before we went on the air, uh, how long did it take before you felt comfortable in the ring? And I thought about it, and I said, well, I don't know. Six, about seven years. It was seven years for me, too. Now, put that in context. Mm. We were seven years, 350 plus days a year, wrestling minimum 20, 25, 35, 45, sometimes 55 minutes a night, double shots on Saturdays and Sundays. Mm. So in a month's time, we were getting what these kids today are getting in a year or mm -hmm. two. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were in the ring with guys that were <laughs> legitimate icons yeah. and future Hall of Famers and all of that. Just shut up and listen, kid, and learn, you know? I, I just wanted to learn my craft. And so, like, to, my rebuttal to Scott would be, uh, by the way, you know, we've, we've buried the hatchet about as much as we're probably going to bury the hatchet. Uh, I'll never back down from telling the truth of the story uh, because the fans, I think, deserve to know it. Uh, you know, if there's, like, I've heard, story, you know, Sean say, well, he wasn't very good. <laughs> well, Sean says that, you know, and, and look, I, I, I've, I've said it a million times. Sean is, mm -hmm. if not the, he's one of the great all-time well, in-ring workers. measuring stick for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. But if I can go and have a great match with Sandman in ECW, mm -hmm. with Mikey Whipwreck in ECW, PJ in ECW. All different and, approaches. And, yeah, and you're... And what he says is because he's got this big thing that him and Flair, he's better than Flair. And all that kind of. One thing about Flair, and people know my differences with Flair, Flair could make a broomstick look great, right? <laughs> he could. And uh, so if you can't take that guy in ECW 
that can, has that gift of gab and can work in the ring with all these different styles and you can't have a good match with that guy, then there's clearly a problem on one side of the equation. Mm. Uh, we were wrestling, uh, Bill Watts was there, and we wrestled in Valparaiso, Indiana, uh, Valparaiso University, uh, in a dark match. And the place was packed, 17,000 people. And I knew what Watts was doing because I'd worked for him. He's in the back glued to that monitor and watching what kind of chemistry these two have. And we go to lock up, and Sean takes a flat back bump, and he's laying in the ring laughing. Well, I knew Bill Watts right then had steam coming out of his ears. And I said, nice, you want to get your ass stretched, you best get, back, get, best get back to your feet. And he jumped up, covered about, take it easy, Dean, just ribbon, just ribbon, Dean, that kind of shit. Well, I don't rib in the ring, mm. you know, because, the, A, those people, those 17,000 people paid their money. They didn't, come you, to, they didn't come yeah. to see a comedy show. They came to see two guys wrestle, two guys they've got a lot of respect for. And I knew Watts was having a stroke right now. So I came back to the curtain, livid. And it was the only time I'd ever spoken back to Bill. Bill, I apologize. I, I came walking back and looked at me and went, you know, Bill was usually rah, 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 rah. And he just was speechless. He opened his arms like, what the fuck? And I said, uh, I looked at him and I said, don't want to hear it. Talk to your golden boy. And, uh, you know, and that just started this long litany of things. And, and the reason I think it hurt me personally at the time was in 1990, everybody in the WWF called me, Sean, Marty, and Dustin, the four amigos. Where you saw one of us, you saw four of us. When we would go to Pittsburgh, I'd give the key to my brother's house, who was a set designer in Hollywood, uh, and make yourselves at home, you know. And Scott Hall, conversely, when Johnny Ace and I were together, we would always allow him to jump in the car. It was very rare, if I, if I can't even recall a time that he ever paid for gas. Uh, mm -hmm. When it came time to eat dinner, you know, I don't have any, I'll just stay here. Well, of course, come on, you're going to eat dinner, right? And, you know, stuff like that. So now you do that kind of stuff for me. I don't care if it's 50 years ago. If I'm in a position today, brother, I got your back, you know, and, and it was just completely different up there. Yeah. And, you know, I was well versed enough in the business. The first time I worked with Scott, uh, Bill was still there. Bill was there at the time. And uh, we were in Lansing, Michigan. And I had been doing vignettes for several, about a month, month and a half, maybe two months. And we walked into the room. It was me, uh, Bob Backlund, uh, X-Pac, and Sean, or Scott. And uh, Bill was in there, and we walked in, and it was a long first aid room. And there was a gurney that S Scott was sitting on, you know, he's doing this. He's having a good old time. And uh, Bill comes in and goes, okay, tonight, guys, it's Sean, it's Scott, it's you versus Shane. And uh, Pac, you're going to be at ringside with, with uh, you're going to be out there doubling for Scott. And Bob's going to be out there with you, Shane. And he stops, he looks at the clipboard, and he goes, uh, Shane, what do you use for a finish? And as soon as he said that, Scott Hall went from this to... Boo boo face. <laughs> and I thought, like, dude, like, this is wrestling, you know? When I lose, I don't really lose. And when I win, I don't really win. We're out there giving the fans a show. And that night in the ring, I had certainly been well versed enough in the business and taught by and trained by enough qualified people in the business. I knew when I was getting the lead ass, I knew when I was getting the stutter step to throw the timing off. And, uh, I, we were outside on the floor and I went to pick him up the body slam and it was like, you know, Scott was a big guy, but he's not yeah. like an Andre big guy right, or an Undertaker right, big right. guy. And I went to pick him up for a slam and it was like picking a Volkswagen up. Uh, and so I looked and on the post, there was a square plate. Remember the square plate that was right at the bottom of the yes, post where yep, it met, yep, the, yep. met the, uh, the, the mat? So I took him and I slammed him into that and I let him go to slide down to scra scrape up his back. And I thought, we can do this the easy way or we can do it the hard way. And, you know, it just was like this constant push-pull. And, uh, you know, I've, I didn't agree with it then. I don't agree with it now. Does he uh, have big man complex? Is he like the epitome of that? Because it seems like if you're smaller than him, he's like... He's got a jerk complex. Oh, yeah. there you go. Uh, I, I was, uh, what do you mean, an asshole complex? Well, listen, I was... Because uh, that's what I call it. No, I'm actually quite embarrassed about this because I was trying to hang with the cool kids for a long time and I hung out with them and I traveled with Scott. And I was friends with Scott for a long time. I actually brought Scott to work with me in ECW in 2000 in Poughkeepsie. And uh, he's just, man, he's he's just not a good person. He's got a lot of issues. And uh, recently, I, I in the past year, I've had some more, like, negative, uh, we're not friends anymore. And uh, it took me a long, I, I mean, I always saw what he was. And, um, and it's a shame, you know, because I, I had a lot of uh, empathy and sympathy for him because I've struggled with addiction and alcoholism myself, and he's had... <laughs> You know, it's a tough road. Yeah, but uh, it's nonetheless, it's not. And he had a tough childhood, but it's not an excuse to be a dick. 
Thank um, you. And I know Sean, and I haven't spoken to Sean since 2000, Sean Michael since 2006, but I know Sean has at least attempted to change his life. I don't know how it is to be around him or work with him, but I know Scott has never changed. And uh, it's, it's a sad life. He doesn't get along with his son, Cody. Who's mm-hmm. in the business? Now. Is this, is well, this, I, I've just, got. He's just. He's just who. He's never going to change. I've got a. I've got a, another Scott Hall question for you. I just want to take a quick commercial break. Excuse me. All right. So back on the Scott Hall thing, um, and correct me if I'm wrong. I believe uh, you were running the independent show, that infamous show where Scott Hall mm. could barely move, that went viral. I wasn't re- I, it wasn't my show. I had okay. booked, I, we'd gotten booked on it. We were okay. booked to work together. You were there, though. So yes, I was w- there. where was your stance <coughs> on that promoter putting him out there like that? I mean, How much of, of in the back did you see of him before he got out there? Did we? Oh, did you uh, s- the whole time he had he'd just come out of the hospital. Were you amazed that he was allowed to approach the ring? <laughs> oh, were you just laughing? Brother, I mean, I wasn't. No, I wasn't laughing. Oh, he, had he, been, had, he had been to the hospital that right. day. That day. That day. He had still really? had the band on. Okay. When I when I saw him, and he was and there that morning for. He was there at four. We I got he got there. He flew in from uh, Orlando. I got there around four o'clock, and he was already. Uh, I guess he'd gone to the hospital to get medication. And he was already uh, in the hole. And I mean, Ooh. obviously, it was irresponsible of the promoter to let. That. I mean, it was an embarrassment. I was out there trying to pull it off too. I mean, I was I was uh, messed up, uh, but I was trying to. I, I mean, I guess I was just as guilty. But I mean, I guess you know it was very irresponsible. You don't let somebody go out there like that. But at the end of the day, too, what do you tell the people? Mm-hmm. I mean, this is a small independent promotion that probably paid a ton of money to mm-hmm. get him in there, and he's going to mm-hmm. get paid no matter what. Mm-hmm. I guess. I mean, I don't know. It's it. It was just a. Oh, I'm sure he was getting paid. The but they should have at no least. Uh, it was, I don't know what you do in that wow. situation, brother. Wow. You know, because then you have to refund money. I mean, it was just, yeah. it was I, just uh, a shit. I show, honestly man. think you. It was refund horrible. the money. It was hard. I can't. You it was horrible for everybody it. involved. Oh yeah, I was. Yeah. I was never been more embarrassed. But then again, as a what I, the only thing, and I'm not justifying any of this, by the way. But the only thing I could think of for a small independent promoters, they probably never. They lose their shirts and never. Well, what, but what do you do? Look, what do you? Yeah, it's we, a bad we talk situation. about this all the time, Don't right? Don't book the guy. You're you're you're, you're promoting you wrestling events because at some point, you know, you guys are icons, right? And yeah. you know, yeah. people, you know, are enamored by you guys. Yeah, so if someone no, comes up true. like that, it's like you know, what do you do? We you know what what's the situation? Yeah. Uh, Hall was in here speaking about how the WWE paid for his numerous rehabs. Yeah. What's your what's Six. your what's your feedback on Vince McMahon owing pro wrestlers like yourself lifetime medical lifetime pensions? Uh, is oh. Vince responsible for you know? Well, not just that. Like I mean, I, what, I mean, what, why is he inheriting Crockett's guys from the old days? He's got to pay for them too. I, I don't. Get at what this. point does Vince have to keep sending you to rehab if you can't get your shit together? That's you a know? PR move, anyways. Yeah. Yeah, because a lot of guys were dying. I mean, I, I'll, I'll I'll say it right here. I've gone to rehab on his dime three times. Just not to be a hypocrite and let everybody know the truth. That's not going to, you know, but it, you know, um, I think it's a PR move. And at the time, because a lot of guys were dying and it's almost like to say, look, if something happens, we do the best we can to provide, you know. Do you think Vince does the best he can? No. I don't think so. Uh, like I said, I two think it's two? a PR move. You okay, know, I'm, I'm grateful it's there. Don't get me wrong. But, sure, sure. Because you know, it helped me sure. very much. I, right. I, I'm going to take a name out of this and just give the scenario. Uh, like Pete said, uh, it's a PR move, and it was a necessary PR move, right? You, know, yeah. you, you as a publicly traded company, you can't have your icons dropping dead in hotel rooms. Uh, but that said, to me, having been through the addiction thing one time, thank God. Uh, the hardest part was not getting clean. The hardest part was learning how to stay clean. Mm-hmm. And you know, when when you're sitting like getting and don't get me wrong, getting off was pretty damn tough. But then every minute of every day it's saying, Come on, you it's been a month, you can take a point, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And you just gotta keep driving till it's it becomes less and less and less till it stops. Mm-hmm. To me, Vince McMahon has an incredible tool there that he chooses not to use because if I give wrestler A rehab one time 50 times uh i can also then put a carrot and say if you stay clean for six months a year see if we have something for you mm-hmm. you put the carrot out there 
And I've heard multiple stories from friends of mine that they've been told, you know, it ain't happening. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you know, to that, you know, to somebody who goes and puts that a prodigious amount of work in, and, and I mean it is a mountain to climb, and then to be told, hey, sorry, I did all I'm going to do. Get out. Uh, you know, there's a story, uh, I will say his name because I, I have so much respect for him. Ivan Koloff. Mm. I saw him about seven months before he died. I walked into a show, worked with C.W. Anderson that night in North Carolina. Uh, Ivan and his wife were sitting at the merchandise table. I was called, we always called him Uncle Ivan, so I walked over again. He was a great guy from the day I met him. And I've heard stories, but we were all assholes when we were younger. I was <laughs> bigger than most. Uh, but Ivan, you know, okay. was a, he was a devout Christian. He, he talked to you all day long. He cared about people and human beings. And I walked over and gave him a hug, and he said, Shane, you used to be a teacher, right? And I said, yes, sir. And he reached in his suit pocket, and he pulled out an envelope. And he said, well, you do me a favor and read this and tell me what you think. So I opened it up and read it. And it started off with, it was a letter from Ivan to Vince McMahon, thanking him and his father for all the opportunities, how much he enjoyed working for them. But the second paragraph, like, boing, jumped off the page at me because it said, I'd like to be considered for a Legends contract. I had just read somebody's Legends contract, and it was the most bogus piece of shit I'd ever seen. PR? <laughs> not not PR. I mean, it was, <laughs> it, it basically was you're signing over everything, even though it says multiple times you're not. Right. If you followed through, like skip four to Schedule C, back to this appendix and this and that. Yeah. If you diagrammed it out, at the end, you were signing your, 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 life, over. your life over. And I told him, I said, Uncle Ivan, I just, you know, you don't trust me. Don't want to. He goes, I know exactly what it is, Shane. He said, I don't know how long I'll even be around. And then what he told me was what he had written in the letter. He said, I would like to be able to walk down the beach with my wife one time mm -hmm. before I die and not be in pain. He then thanks Vince and God blesses him. I said, Uncle Ivan, if you know what a Legends contract is and you're fine with that, I said, you know, I'd give the letter an A-plus if I was grading it. And as he's putting it away, he said, well, thank you. And he went like this. He reaches in the other side, and as he's pulling out the envelope, I see the WWE logo. And I said, Uncle Ivan, that's your personal business, brother. That's none of my business. He said, no, I'd like you to read it. So I, I wish I hadn't, but I opened it up and pulled it out. The, the whole letter was this long. It wasn't even professionally, you know, like, addressed. <laughs> Mr. Real. Real Paris, 123 right. Main Street said, Ivan, I don't know why you're writing me this letter. This has nothing to do with my company. After all, I, this has nothing to do with my business. After all, I don't run a fucking welfare company. Whoa. Vince. To Ivan Koloff. Wow. And, you know, like, d do I think Vince is responsible for taking care of Troy Martin? No. But do I think these guys that have sacrifice their marriages and their relationships with their kids in many a cases and done themselves real physical harm in the business uh should there be some responsibility uh take the concussion for instance mm. uh the nfl tried to conceal that got caught with their pants down and did the white right thing they settled the lawsuit and took care of their players vince mcmahon in 1995 did a segment with sean uh, about the concussion mm, with the doctor and right, saying, you know, there's right. long-term mm. effects to this and everything else. Right. Suddenly, saying that, see if you can find that on the network. Yeah. It's disappeared. <laughs> uh, and, and he has steadfastly fought that. And, you know, there, there, is a, there is legally right, and then there's morally and ethically right, and then there's being a human being. Right. And uh, I would contend that somebody like an Ivan Koloff Deserved to be able to get his, so you understand, he would broken his ankles like dozens of times, and both ankles were fused under. He's hobbling on the sides of his feet. Uh, uh, Kamala, right? Jim's had his legs amputated, and these these people. Can, I, I don't want a damn dime from the jackass, but there are some people that can use that help, and, and I think again, there's a, there's a moral obligation to this. The guy's a multi 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 billionaire in part because of the work that these guys had afforded up to him. Mm. And to then just be discarded or uh, told you're begging for welfare because you know, you'd like to get your ankles fixed. Uh, I, I, I just see like a, a discrepancy. If you're gonna mm -hmm. send me to rehab 20, 23 yeah. times at 50 grand a pop, but this guy needs a couple thousand or 10,000 to get his ankles fixed. Right. I mean, let's be honest, to, to, to a guy like Vince McMahon, that's the change we have in our pocket. It's, it's disgusting. It's so disgusting. he should take care of Marty's yeah. foot. Absolutely. Marty's foot. So, hey. so let's roll it into Heyman then, right? Okay. You both work under Heyman, yep. right? Yep. Heyman uses you guys to build his career because you guys made his career, actually. Mm -hmm. yep. Sure. Then, then, correct me if I'm wrong, kind of like leaves you guys in a lurch, mm -hmm. 
runs the business under the ground, doesn't pay you. I don't know if he didn't pay either one of you. I know he didn't pay no. a bunch of people, right? <laughs> he's waving. And now, now he's probably a millionaire working for the WWE. You ever get annoyed There's, when you see the, Heyman well, in today's state? I mean, like that no good Rick and Rack and Russell Frost. I, 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 I have no feelings. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm wow, assuming the same. Like, just don't, it, okay. it, it's a yin and yang, right? For me, uh, you know, Paul Heyman gave me the opportunity to be the franchise sure. character that, I'm, sure. that I'll, I'll be forever known as. And just incredible. And just sure. incredible. Absolutely. And so you can and most importantly from a from a creative standpoint never micromanaged never came in to, at least to me and said okay Shane go out and do this and this and this and then this at the end and make sure you say this and that he would give me a general over you know go out and mention Taz you know get, get heat on funk whatever mm -hmm. uh, you know and allowed us to be creative that was the fun part of the business and I'm hearing today the kids are told you know by the agents do this and this yeah. and this and here read this teleprompter and not that what fun would that be you know, I'm just regurgitating somebody else's garbage. Did, oh, did either of you ever grow uneasy, just just for real, with the amazing amount of heat you were both able to draw? Like, whoa, maybe I do my job too good. Dude, you were hated. <laughs> you were hated. I loved you, but oh, everybody I mean, else. Yeah, yeah. It's the truth, though. I mean, I mean, how was this behind the scenes? Easy. Do you look in the mirror and go, man, yeah. maybe I'm doing my job too good because yeah. you used to get, and you, of course, yeah. but... I mean, they want to reach through the set. It's just, like, just incredible. <laughs> it was fun. I was. Yeah. Just, you were uh, great at it, but it, it just allowed me to be the person I, I am not in real life. Right. Uh, yeah, okay. I am a kind and gentle. You know me. I barely say boo to anybody. <laughs> um, I have my flaws, like all of us do. But mm. you know, nonetheless, I, I, I just allows me to play. Yeah. in the sandbox and I just went out there and just <laughs> went big. Okay. And just uh, and I also just tried to do you know. Uh, stuff that was going on, you know, stuff that I would see, because uh, back then, you know, you there was so much going on with uh, the Attitude Era and the NWO. So my character was just a combination of a lot of the people I liked and admired, mm -hmm. and I just went out there and just, just whatever name stuff. I do whatever stuff, you, you know. Real quick, name a couple of guys uh, you admired. Uh, Ric Flair, <laughs> you know. Okay. Um, Ricky Steamboat. Uh, there he is. You know, yeah. uh, Shawn Michaels. There he is. And okay. uh, at the time, as a, you know, Razor Ron as a performer. Sure. You know, Absolutely. One of the greatest yeah. performers of all time. One of my all time right. favorites. So, uh, it kills know. me to, you yeah. know. Well, I mean, it is what it is. Think but about it just him gave that me way. an opportunity just to go out there and have fun. And like Shane said so eloquently, uh, Paul let you kind of find yourself. I yeah. mean, one of the best matches I've ever had in my career was with this man in mm. Philadelphia, mm. Pennsylvania. It was I fun. Oh my mm. God. I still, <laughs> when I show somebody a match, it's usually that one. Really? Yes, yeah. Thank yeah, you. It was, was, I know, it, was, it, it, it was the most, because we didn't really call much. No. You know, we just went out there and we're, again, Flair Steamboat kind of stuff. Yeah. Just chops back and forth. And when you know you can trust, not to cut you off, when you know no, you no, can no. trust the guy you're in the ring with, oh. that he's gonna pull his end of the bargain. That allows you complete liberty because yes. right. now you can go out and be the franchise. Because I know PJ's got his side right. covered, and then you you, open up. yeah, and then you just hit like a, you know, every great match I've ever had. You just hit like sort of a groove, yeah. and it just it's almost like autopilot. Like you, you get done with the match, you're like right. not even sure what you just did, but it just, it just yeah, it just flows. And you know, you're not going to get hurt. You're right, you're in there with a certain friend, yeah. God forbid. Yeah, but you know, you right. know, you're not going to get potatoed by somebody who's right. you know purposely trying to. Yeah, it's it's got to be know, difficult to perform it, freely so, if was, you're afraid someone's going to dump you on your head. Sure. How can you it's possibly amazing. be loose? It was, yeah, it's absolutely. An experience when you work with a guy like that. How did it Thank feel you. when you have got your world title and had the chance to well, carry the mantle for? Before, you know, before he answers that, we got to yeah. take a quick commercial oh, break. We'll okay. be right back. Paper straw is holding pretty tight. Well, no, maybe man, not. That, that's not working. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start sucking. It's going to start spraying out the other yeah, yeah, side. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're back. Go ahead, Farrow. Sorry yeah, to cut you just off. Just a buddy. reminder, uh, Justin, when you finally won the world title, which I thought was an awesome moment for you, how did it feel to uh, basically carry, continue to carry the mantle that Shane had helped build for ECW, my um, personal favorite company? It was, uh, I, first of all, I didn't find out until about halfway into the show. Really now? Yeah, Surprise? Well, well, what was oh going on uh, was uh, at the time, I believe, Taz had come in. He was in WWF. Taz had come in to beat Mike Awesome, who was in WCW. WCW, that's right. That was, that was <laughs> so, cool. So uh, Taz, Taz was, was wrestling cool. Tommy Dreamer, and I was doing something else on the show. Like a small, I didn't have a match. Small segment or whatever. And uh, it was presented to me like a couple matches right before. I so went you on. pull into the parking lot. You don't even have a match that night? Mm -mm. 
And you well, walk I mean, Paul, out of there. Paul knew what was going to happen. I just oh, didn't my know. Lord. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, uh, I was just look like, like Shane said. I, I mean, it's not it's not like you win the win it or lose it. It's it's a you know it's a performance. Thing. I'm such a nerd. To me, it's but it's, I know it's but like it you know mean, uh, what it meant to me though. In uh, in retrospect. Uh, it's that Paul trusted me to be the world champion, sure. to yeah. uh, carry that end of the bargain, That's which right. meant that um, you know, in a world where there's WWE, uh, WCW, and ECW, the top, you know, I was somewhere in that echelon of, wow, you're That's you're right. pretty good, kid. Yep. So that's what it meant to me is that uh, you know I'd finally gotten to a place. Uh, that I could be an elite performer, and it did yeah. mean it did mean something to me. I didn't mark out like you know, oh my god, but it was. Uh, <laughs> you it mean was, you didn't take a selfie with it strapped over <laughs> your shoulder? There was no selfies and... back then. I wish there were. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it was uh, it was it was awesome. I was just very I was very happy, and like yeah. in something so trivial where, you know, back in the day they well they still do it now. They had the top five hundred. Yeah, was number six that year. Yes, you so are. Even though it's fake. Well, yes, you are. Awesome. Even though no, no, it's wait, scripted. Wait. Whoa, there we go. Nice. There we go. You know, there the we go. F. Yeah, <laughs> he said the F word. Even though it, it's a scripted business, <laughs> it still meant that sure. I was in the landscape of all these amazing performers. Right. And, and, and athletes. And, I should say athletes. Yeah, yeah and to the wrestling nerd at home, that was it. You won the world title, bro. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, you know, Yankees win. Uh, Yankees win. You know what I mean? Here's something that's not fake, though. Right? The boys taking care of the boys. Yeah. Um. Okay. You both were friends with Candido. Oh, yeah. We had covered yeah. last time yeah. you were on yeah. here, Shane. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'd like Justin to weigh in on. Please. When do you did you try to slap Candido and say, "Don't let these people take advantage of you, Sonny, What she was doing to him. I mean, uh, you were pretty close friends with the guy, right? Yeah. Uh, he was. Uh, he was the reason I got to ECW. Really? No. Yeah. Uh, I was in. Um, I had, when I was kind of Aldo was fizzling out. I went to Vince's office uh, in Stanford called a meeting and uh, I asked for my release because okay. Scott and Kevin had said we can get you a job in WCW or something else we'll get you paid whatever so I went to ask for my release he said no um, we'll send you to Memphis to be a heel which is kind of a rib but <laughs> yeah. I, I mean whatever yeah. you know, so I went um, to Memphis Jerry Lawler's territory USWA to, for six weeks and at the time ECW was there uh, doing the angle with uh, USWA with Jerry Lawler mm -hmm. and Chris was there and Tammy was there and Tommy and Van Dam, I'd never met those guys. Uh, but uh, Chris is like, you should come over to, you know, to ECW. I'll, you know, introduce you to Paul and get you in. And I, I was like, I was kind of intimidated because I heard all these things about ECW. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I don't oh, I know. Bet. I said, I don't know, Chris. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, you know, I don't know. And he goes, it's not like that. You know, like everybody, you know, it's really, you know, it's wrestling. It's, you know, some guys do some things, other guys, yeah. you know, we got good workers there. I said, all right. And uh, that's, you know, that's what happened. So, uh, yeah, I mean, look, when that stuff, I mean, when I was there in WWF, I was, I was so young and so scared all the time. I saw what was happening to Chris. I think we all kind of did, but yeah. what do you say? Right. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't have the heart. It's his life. I mean, does he have a clue? Or is he just, like, clueless he, yeah. to what's going if on? you didn't know. Yeah, he knows. Come on. Yeah. I mean, Chris was a very uh, non-confrontational kind of person. Yeah. He would walk 20 miles out of his way to avoid confrontation. Right. Yeah. He'd give you the shirt off his back. He'd dig a ditch for you yeah. if he needed. Yeah. Uh, but he didn't want to get into yeah. this yeah. fuck you, fuck you thing. Uh, and so I think he turned an eye to it. And I think he genuinely, well, I know he genuinely loved Tammy. Yeah. And so he would... You know, like we all do, right? We overlook things. I've I overlooked plenty of stupid sure. things in my in my relationship. Uh, you know, and and I think that was the biggest part. You mix those two together, and that set Chris up for well, a lot of not to bring it back to Scott Hall, but when he was in here, he's like, it "Was none of my business. People could do whatever they want." And then two was, he thought it was Candido and Sonny's little deal. Like they. Did yeah, that? That was not. their deal. That's they like that. Mix that's, really that's a convenient. Yeah. Yeah. What the? Right? Yeah. Hey, don't don't blame my friend who just fucked your wife right. because it's right. the thing right. that they get, that yeah. they have. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, no, come it on. was nothing like that. Yeah. Did you just want to slap the shit out of like Sean? Was or, there anybody you know, either one of you wanted to smack the shit out of there in your career? Like, what is your effort? Oh, you know yeah. what? No, I'm serious. <laughs> give us one each. Just give us if one. If you can, absolutely. For me, the, the, when I, I say this, I don't say this just like to be you know uh, pat to what we're talking about uh but when i would when i was in wwf in 1995 the only way i could go there and not smack the shit out of sean or razor or somebody was there's 23 miles from my house to the pittsburgh airport 
and you know somebody like PJ will, a performer will understand this I would transform into the franchise en route to the airport understand and would stay in that 24 7 until I would come back and decompress driving home from the airport mm -hmm. and would be so fucking mentally exhausted mm, yeah and like, oh it's not easy it's being the pharaoh. Go on. <laughs> go on. And, you know, it just it, it really wiped you out. But that was the only way you could do it was to put on that game face yeah. and sort of mm. put yourself in that world of fake WWE, mm. death, or E, whatever. Then, yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, just turn cheek to it. And I had asked Chris one time if he wanted me to go have a talk with Sean. And he said, please don't. Mm. I think he was afraid of getting the pushback from the company. Right. Uh, you know, Sean That's was their golden boy. And, you know, to me, and... and I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to take a stab at those guys knew what they were doing. They knew that they were protected. And so, like, you know, without having to go into the long-winded story, the, the story about Pierre. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, you know, yeah. when you see yeah. something like that, these guys are being driven around in limousines flying first class. Me, Peach, Tammy, and Chris were, remember we had bags on our laps, behind yeah. our heads, yeah. everything else. Welcome to here. Wendy's. Can I take your order? Correct. <laughs> and, and not complaining. <laughs> hey, we were on the road and having fun. Yep. Yeah, yeah. But to see them then turn their sights mm -hmm. on this guy only because he wanted to do what the owner of the company said to do, <clears throat> that shows you what kind of level of human beings you're dealing with. And I remember being in the room and they were doing that and kicking that around. And I felt like I was watching a woman being raped. I wanted to go take a shower. I was like, what the? Right. What are we doing here, you know? I'm thinking of the word hazing, but it seems like it's almost worse. Oh, that's right. not I don't think that's hazing. That's no, 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 I think no, no, that's, that's flat out well, that, just yeah, being... What is that? That's yeah. being disrespectful. Look, but they've all, they've all gotten this. older oh and they've God. thought about what they've done. And mm. Sean has found Jesus and that's Scott Hall is in here. When he's, he's not shooting deer, guy. he's found Jesus. But go on. Some things are just unforgivable. Yeah. I mean, Jesse, you want to weigh in on this, or...? Look, man, they, it was a time in the business where, and, and let me tell you, and that's, this is the funny thing, too, is uh, they, they weren't making all that, that much money then. Really? No. Okay. Uh, Scott would cry to me. Or were they bit. blowing whatever they were making? No, I mean, you know, maybe a little bit, but Scott was <laughs> crying that he, he would be scared that he couldn't pay the electric on his, on his house. Really? No. He, he okay. wasn't making a lot of money. I mean, okay. those were lean times, but... It's all a bunch of, I don't know, man. It was, it was a lot of drugs involved, let me tell you that. Everybody mm -hmm. was effed up. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of drugs. But it's incestuous, isn't it? You're a family. Yeah. It's like, you know, that's your there sister no, was, in some terms. There was terms. no family over there. No. See, and it was, that all, was all, for, yeah. all for one and one for all. I mean, not... One private was, little party was, and everybody else was... But move it to ECW then. You want to take it from the WWE. Uh, we had uh, Two Cold Scorpio in here. Yeah. He said while Good Candido guy. was wrestling, Brian Lee yeah. was pounding Sonny yeah. in the back while they were watching a match. Yep, yep. That, yep. That, happened too. that happened with uh, when uh, when uh, Candido and Tom Pritchard would wrestle opening match. Hunter, when he first got in, would uh, sit back and watch the matches when the match was over, go and knock on the ladies' locker room because back then it was only Tammy. Yeah, it wasn't like there was a ton of girls, right? To let them know that you know, match is over, you're coming back. You know, it's just pull your pants up, the well, match is over. Speaking of, <laughs> speaking of what's speaking going on here? Yeah. yeah. Speaking <laughs> of Hunter, though, Hunter oh seems like he he was a pretty decent guy, right? No, he's no? A piece of shit. <laughs> oh, oh, very interesting. No, yeah. Tell he's me more. Tell me more. Well, when I first got there, um, I started traveling with him, and I was there when Joni China first came mm. to the company she was just a local she didn't look like she died at the end mm -hmm. um and she was just a humble kid from uh, new hampshire and hunter just man as it as that one in one year he went from a normal guy to just you know a lackey for those guys biggest was, biggest was, opportunist opportunist you've ever yeah, come across yeah uh, yeah and uh sure. look smart guy uh, I, you, you well, can't say he's stupid he's, he's a billionaire you know now you know what i wouldn't want to be him if wow. you gave me, i got if I could you switch I with him i like i mean I, I have a lot of difficulties in in a lot of areas but i would not want to be him mm. so I understand, yeah, well, there, I understand. There, you know there's a thing in our in our business that i was I would hear these stories from Dominic and Bruno and all those guys about the camaraderie and the, the you know the, the each everybody had each other's back and that mm. and I had never seen that in anywhere in, in in my career bits and pieces in the NWA bits and pieces in UWF but it wasn't until I got to the ECW that I knew that if like I, like in Allentown got attacked by the fan and. Uh, the dressing room emptied out and dragged me by my hair over the railing and built a wall around me. Uh, 
half those guys probably couldn't stand my guts at the time. Uh, but it was us right. as a family. Right. And to me, like you know, not to be the old historian, right? But you know, they, back in the ancient days, they had the inner holy of holies in the churches, right? The synagogues. And that was the place that only certain people, only the high priests were allowed to, to go into. The dress rooms are in our Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. I can go in there and be Troy Martin, cut up with PJ. We can go out and tear the house down that night, whatever. But it's us versus them. Versus them in the sense of the audience. It's us to convince them that we're beating the shit out of each other. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, hey, audience, come on in the dress room and, and, and meet Troy Martin and mm -hmm. Peter Polacco. Uh, you know, and, and that was something that I'd never seen. And then when I went to WWF in 95 and saw the exact counter to that and all these yeah. things we're talking about, uh, you know, they're, not to sound corny, but at the end of the night, I got to put my head on a pillow and go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And I'm one of those people who's been cursed with a conscience. Uh, and, you know, I... Sucks, doesn't it? Yeah. It's, it's terrible. It does. And so I, I found out that life is a whole lot easier if I just don't screw exactly yeah, yeah. just mm -hmm. go get up in the morning go to, and no bullshit in between mm -hmm. and I sleep like a baby I want to ask you guys both real quickly um, Dean Ambrose known as John Moxley now has done something very interesting and I'm sure some of some of our friends from an artistic standpoint are probably thrilled with this but I, I find it interesting he has left Vince as you guys both know and now he's in AEW as you guys both know and he's basically hardcore yeah, and I find it interesting. Now, those of us who have followed him remember him from CZW Combat Zone, so we know Dean's a psycho in the ring and everything. How do you feel about him <laughs> actually leaving Vince, going this route, obviously physically killing himself at this point, probably for less money than Vince was giving him? I have to assume. How does this guy make you guys feel as, um, I guess, hardcore artists and, and, and prototypes of the genre. What, what do you feel like when you see Dean Ambrose taking less money? Should he have taken the safer route? And that just I don't, that might have been the longest Listen. question ever yeah. asked in the history of broadcasting. I thought it was well-worded. What's the problem? Oh, my God. Have an attention span. Right, I'll take this real quick, and then I'm sure you know, Shane will want to, because I do a podcast with Vince Russo, and we specifically talk AEW. Right. I think he's getting paid probably as well. He wrestles one night a week. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And not on the road all that time. That mm -hmm. was the beauty of ECW. Okay. Was we only, you know, we wrestled a limited schedule, not 30, you know, we wouldn't go on tour in Germany for 30 days. <laughs> right. Oh, God. So I think to him, it's, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure he's making good money. And if he's taking less money, he's working on Wednesday nights. Mm. And he's taking whatever indie bookings, if he chooses. Yeah. It's not no, gonna. It's great. not gonna last. Has he heard his exposure? Because you know I don't the, think so. the WWE's I, ratings I, are either, even though they complain today, it's still two million, two and a half million people. It's a lot a, of people. AEW did uh, almost a million people. So okay. where's the? I, I think he wins. Interesting. And I would have done the same thing. Interesting. The only caveat I would add to that is, uh, you know, he he's older now than he was. Uh, and uh, speaking of somebody that's, that's you know traversed that road. Uh, Terry Funk told me years, probably I was about 25, 27 years old, he said, I was calling me Shano. He said, you know, Shano, uh, one day that, that, that bump tank will be empty mm. and it never, there's no place bump to tank. refill it. Wow. And, you know, when you go in there and you start taking those crazy bumps, especially how old's Moxley, 36, 37? Mm -hmm. uh, He's up there. Get yeah, there. that's, that, that's going to put mileage on him a lot quicker than if he was 27 years old. And but I'm a firm believer because we had the liberty in ECW. If that's what John Moxley wants to do, and the fans are buying it, mm -hmm. then the artist should be allowed to have that 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 autonomy to do that. Chris Jericho amazes you guys both at this point in his career that he still does what he does because he's amazing. Yeah, it's ridiculous at this point. I, I I would I was pretty much expecting this from him because he's been around the business. He's a smart kid. Reinvents himself yes. over and over and over. I've never seen yeah. anything like him. His track yeah. record's ridiculous. The yeah. reinventing. Listen, yeah. guys, I got about two minutes. I want to bring Eric Sims in nice. uh, from ESS Promotions. Eric, welcome. Thanks for having me back again. Good to be back up here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, starting the 35th uh, year of ESS. 35 so years. 35 really years. Really now? Wow. 35, You're uh, classic. Uh, thank you. There, there you go. go. 1985. Okay. You okay. Know. Holy Hulk Hogan. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Listen. Yeah. Around there you I, go. Listen, I was back in the, and the, by the, the way, golden, the golden, they called the golden days. Eric, nice mug shot with Vince McMahon. I oh, saw that on Facebook. That, 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 it was blurry. It was blurry. It was, blurry. It was a nice picture. So where are you and the boys going to be? All right. So uh, today, January 11th, uh, from 1 to 3 p.m., we are 
we're at uh, the Wrestling Universe over in uh, Flushing, Queens, New York, and uh, the boys have been there plenty of times, and we love going to the Wrestling Universe in Queens, New York, and so come support us over there. And then tonight, Titan Championship Wrestling, the debut show of Titan Championship Wrestling. Same promoters, minus one, but a new attitude, new look, down at the Bar at Barnegat American Legion Hall, Shane Douglas, oh, and by the just way, incredible. And by the way, and the and by the way they're supposed to be sponsoring this show. I'm, you know, we're gonna start cutting this guys off, man. So, and we'll uh, we'll get the sponsorship, and we'll talk to we'll talk we'll talk to Billy and get that get that yeah. worked out. But Titan Championship Wrestling tonight, the American Legion Hall, <laughs> four ninety nine North Main Street, Barnegat, New Jersey. Night of the Extreme, just incredible. Shane Douglas, the Sandman, they'll be there, and so should you. All right, well, wow. real quick, guys, for the fans, you got anything, last words? Uh, no, thank you for having me, Eric. Thank you for bringing me on. Thank, thank you for coming. Great, great to see Shane Douglas, and it's, it's going to be nice to uh, to wrestle tonight in Barnicket and see the fans in Flushing, Queens. It's going to be a good time. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Shane? Always great to see you guys, man. It, it, no bullshit. It's nice, relaxed, have fun. Yeah. Cut up. You, you fans miss what goes on between these yes. commercial breaks. <laughs> a, lot of, yeah. a lot of fun <laughs> times Strong in the studio. ESSpromotions.com for everything ESS. I want to thank you guys. It's our honor yeah. that you come Thanks, on man. to our thank little you. show here. But you can catch Monty Nefaro every Thursday, eight thirty. Uh, sorry, eight oh five to nine p.m. <laughs> every Thursday here on Village Connection Radio YouTube. You can also catch us on cable channel one fifteen on Tuesdays from eight thirty to nine p.m. The shortened version. Yeah. And for you early risers on Saturdays from six a.m. to six thirty on channel one fifteen, you can catch us on Anchor, uh, Google. Podcast wherever podcasts are made and on the www.sportsnetwork247.com. And I think in a couple of days we'll yeah. be on channel 20. I don't have the time Aww. slot, so we're all over the place. <laughs> and, you know, if everybody knows Shane has his own podcast, you have your own podcast. So officially we'll probably have to become enemies at some point. What? But, because, you know, <laughs> it's just, you know. There goes the old monthly only, only, only the strong can survive. No, but honestly, or guys. Be a guest on their show? It could be. You but know, who, who wants you? to listen to some fat old guy that has That's no hair? True. I don't know. Wait a I wouldn't. What? Oh, yeah. no, Go on. But I will tell you, <laughs> Shane or Justin, the Pharaoh is for sale. What? Did you reach out to me. What is I going? certainly no, will rent him out to... for uh, you know. We can rent him out on a you know <laughs> per, per diem, a per diem <laughs> yeah, basis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jim, what I, do you think of that? What is going on here? Twenty bucks a day. What am I, a VHS tape? What is this rental crap? You've been watching Long is... Island's right. number one pro wrestling broadcast. Only seen the here live out of Rockstar Studios. Catch us in about four or five minutes really? where ECW superstar Sandman is on the couch. Ah. But again, truly an honor. You guys are gentlemen. Thank you, guys. I have the utmost respect for you guys. Absolutely. First time meeting you, sir. Well, I actually met you at an FTW event. I was, oh, I was oh, actually wow. hosting... Uh, Roddy Piper, and you were the table next. That, do yeah. you remember that? Yeah, I do remember so, that. So, yeah. uh, but Shane, I've met you three times, and i got to tell you, of all the people I've met, You're, people, go you on, are be sappy. grade yep. A. Yep. When I look at you, yep. you are the epitome of a man, and I truly uh, mean that. Um, can I agree with that? I agree with that. <laughs> until Sandman comes in, then you'll be what, like, what you Sandman, oh, here you I go. love you too. <laughs> Want to have a cigarette together, yeah, Sam? Yeah, yeah, listen up, yeah. No. Anyway, you're catching Long Island's number one pro wrestler broadcast. See you in about five minutes. Thank you, guys. Later. Thank you, guys.